Dear Esther, I sometimes feel as if I'd given birth to this island. Somewhere between the longitude and latitude, a split opened up, and it beached remotely here. No matter how hard I correlate, it remains a singularity, an alpha point in my life that refuses all hypothesis. I return each time, leaving fresh markers that I hope, in the full glare of my hopelessness, will have blossomed into fresh insight in the interim. Donnelly reported the legend of the hermit, a holy man who sought solitude Come in its back. most pure form. Allegedly, he rode here from the mainland in a boat without a bottom, so all the creatures of the sea could rise at night to converse with him. How disappointed he must have been with their chatter. Perhaps now, when all that haunts the ocean is the rubbish dumped from the tankers, he'd find more peace. They say he threw his arms wide in a valley on the south side, and the cliff opened up to provide him shelter. They say he died of fever 116 years later. The shepherds left gifts for him at the mouth of the cave, but Donnelly records they never claimed to have seen him. I have visited the cave and I have left my gifts, but like them, I appear to be an unworthy subject of his solitude. At night, you can see the lights sometimes from a passing tanker or trawler. From up on the cliffs, they are mundane. But down here, they fugue into ambiguity. For instance, I cannot readily tell if they belong above or below the waves. The distinction now seems banal. Why not everything and all at once? There's nothing better to do here than indulge in contradictions whilst waiting for the fabric of life to unravel. reading Donnelly by the weak afternoon sunlight. He landed on the south side of the island, followed the path to the bay and climbed the mount. He did not find the caves and he did not chart the north side. I think this is why his understanding of the island is flawed, incomplete. He stood on the mount and only wondered momentarily how to descend. But then, he didn't have my reasons. When someone had died or was dying, or was so ill they gave up what little hope they could sacrifice, they cut parallel lines into the cliff, exposing the white chalk beneath. You could see them from the mainland or the fishing boats, and notice and aid, or impose a cordon of protection, and wait a generation until whatever pestilence stalked the cliff paths died along with its hosts. My lines are just for this to keep any would-be rescuers at bay. The infection is not simply of the flesh.
Dear Esther, I have now driven the stretch of the M5 between Exeter and Bristol over 21 times. But although I have all the reports and all the witnesses, and have cross-referenced them within a millimetre using my ordnance survey maps, I simply cannot find the location. You'd think there would be marks to serve as some evidence. It's somewhere between the turn-off for Sanford and the welcome brake services. But although I can always see it in my rear-view mirror, I have as yet been unable to pull ashore. When the oil lamps ran out, I didn't pick up a torch, but used the moonlight to read by. When I've pulled the last shreds of sense from it, I will throw Donnelly's book from the cliffs and perhaps myself with it. Maybe it will wash back up through the caves and erupt from the spring when the rain comes, making its return to the hermit's cave. Perhaps it will be back on the table when I wake. I think I may have thrown it into the sea several times before. to climb, away from the sea and towards the centre. It is a straight line to the summit, where the evening begins to coil around the aerial and squeeze the signals into early silence. The bothy squats against the mount to avoid the gaze of the aerial. I too will creep under the island like an animal and approach it from the northern shore. <laughs> 